very easy for Americans to remember Charles Darwin's birthday because, by coincidence, he was born on the exact same day, not just the same date, but February 12, 1809, as Abraham Lincoln. Consequently, his celebratory dates come in regular sequence, especially since he published his most famous work, The Origin of Species, in 1859, when he was 50 years old. Consequently, in 1909, there was a grand celebration for the 100th anniversary of his birth and the 50th of his great book. And in 1959, there were celebrations held throughout the world because it was the centenary of the origin of species and the 150th anniversary of Darwin's birth. The biggest of these celebrations was held in Chicago. It resulted in a big three-volume publication. Darwin's grandson, Julian Huxley, Huxley's grandson, were there. And it was a grand party, which was not spoiled. That's not the right phrase, but which was somewhat uh, muted only when the great American geneticist H.J. Muller stepped forward to give a wonderful talk with a very odd title for such a celebration, 100 Years Without Darwin Are Enough. Now, if you read Muller's address, you'll see that he was in part discussing that sad anti-intellectualism that characterizes so much of American history. So he talked about the Scopes trial and creationism. But that was not his main point. His main point in this address was that even among those who are perfectly happy with evolution and who consider themselves to be disciples of Darwin, there's not a great deal of understanding of Darwin's actual words or his own conceptions, and that misunderstanding is rife even among those who consider themselves to be Darwin's disciples. There's a famous story, which is often told in ridicule, in the history of evolutionary thought about an English lady, and I mean that literally the wife of Lord so-and-so, who upon hearing in 1859 of Darwin's ideas was scandalized and is said to have remarked to her husband, oh my dear, let us hope that what Mr. Darwin says is not true. But if it is true, let's hope that it won't become generally known. Now, you, you can say that's a commentary on English class structure in Victorian times, as indeed it is, and you can laugh at this lady, as has traditionally been done. But you know, in a funny sense, what she prophesied has been absolutely correct. Apparently, what Mr. Darwin said is true, and it has not become generally known, that being the source of Muller's complaint. Now, look, evolution has become generally known. That's not the point. Darwin was very clear over and over again in his writing that he tried, had tried to do two very distinctly different things in developing evolutionary theory. First, to establish the fact of evolution. And in that, he was abundantly successful. That's why he was buried in Westminster Abbey when he died in 1882, right at the feet of Isaac Newton. But that was one part, simply to establish that evolution had occurred, and he was abundantly successful there. But his other purpose was to develop a theory of evolutionary mechanisms, the theory of natural selection, in an attempt to explain how evolution had occurred. And in that, during his lifetime, he was not that successful. When he died in 1882, natural selection was reasonably well understood, but was certainly a minority position. And it was only in the 1930s that it became canonical or orthodox and in fact, those 1959 celebrations were as much a party for the enormous success of his theory of evolution, natural selection. So what I want to talk about today is not the fact of evolution, which thinking people accept and have ever since Darwin published that book. What I want to talk about is why the theory of natural selection, which now seems so acceptable to us, had such great difficulty being understood. And to this very day, even among well-educated people who have no personal, psychological, sociological, or religious trouble with evolution, its radical implications are still not widely appreciated. Now, I think if you ask a question of that form, why should a theory not be well understood, the first suspicion for an answer, and it's a perfectly reasonable first suspicion, except that it's wrong, might be that natural selection is very difficult. Maybe it's just hard. Maybe the reason why it's not well grasped is that it's just enormously complex. I remember when I was a kid in New York, the playground rumor had it that only three people in the world understood Einstein's theory of general relativity. Now, I'm sure that's not true, but I'm willing to believe that the main reason why most people don't understand general relativity is that it's hard. So is that the reason why natural selection is not well grasped? And it can't be that. The wonderful thing about natural selection is that it's so simple. There's another famous story, also true, in the history of evolutionary thought, reporting how T.H. Huxley, when he first learned in November of 1859 about the content 
of the theory of natural selection is said to have remarked, and apparently did, how exceedingly stupid of me not to have thought of it myself, because it's so simple. 